there's some intelligent folks who have their own reasons that are discussing mid 20,000 gold and so forth. And all I can say is historically over 50 years, if you go back to the mid 1970s and look where gold was in 1980, like, you know, like seven, eight years later, it went from the mid $30 range to 850. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll look at the 2000 basing period, 2000, 2001, you're 250, $260. Uh, by 2011, you're well, 1920. Okay, you do the multiples. Okay, yeah. right now we're starting from a low at a thousand fifty. We're only doubling. We're up one hundred and forty percent. So so far, dimensionally, relative speaking, it's a much more timid bull market than those were. But remember, most of those bull gains came in the last year of those bull markets, yeah. where gold went vertical, and silver went even more vertical. I think we're in that period now. We're about to enter that. Michael Oliver begins by describing silver as a wild dog on a leash, with a leash held by gold. This vivid metaphor emphasizes the erratic and often unpredictable nature of silver compared to the more stable and steady movement of gold. Silver has a tendency to both outpace and lag behind gold, creating a challenging environment for investors who must navigate its wild swings. In April, gold reached a high of $2,450, while silver lagged at just under $1.30. However, as gold remained relatively flat from April to July, silver surged ahead, hitting $32.70, 10% above its April high. This illustrates silver's capacity to quickly move ahead of gold, only to retreat just as swiftly, as seen when silver later dropped and fell behind gold's performance. Looking ahead, Oliver argues that silver will outpace gold in the coming months. He attributes this to several factors, including the ongoing strength of gold and the renewed interest in gold miners, which have underperformed for years but are now showing signs of life. Newmont Mining, for example, has seen a 60% increase in its stock price over the past six months, attracting significant attention from major asset managers. Oliver notes that silver often reaches a peak spread of about 2 to 3% of gold's price, with historical data showing that this spread is not uncommon. In fact, during certain periods, such as the 1980s, silver even reached 6.5% of gold's price. He suggests that if gold experiences an eightfold increase, as it has in past bull markets, silver's value could soar to unprecedented levels, potentially reaching 2% of gold's price. Oliver dives into the technical aspects of silver's performance, explaining how momentum indicators suggest a stronger future for the metal. By measuring price against long-term moving averages, he identifies a more dynamic momentum in silver than what is visible on the price chart alone. For instance, after peaking at $1.32, Silver dropped to $1.29, only to rebound back to $1.32, creating a potential triple-top formation. Oliver predicts that if silver breaks through this level, it could trigger a significant price surge, drawing in skeptical investors who may have previously doubted silver's potential. This technical analysis extends to the gold mining sector as well, where Oliver sees a pending momentum breakout in GDX, a popular gold miner's F. He believes that a slight increase in GDX's price could lead to a major rally, as it would break through a long-standing ceiling on momentum. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. But first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button, and turn on notifications, so you do not miss out our daily recaps. Uh, silver is a wild dog, we call it, on a leash, and the leash is held by gold. So what gold ultimately does, silver's going to do it too, okay? The problem is that silver both runs ahead of gold like a wild dog and then sometimes runs behind gold. And, right, for example, you go look at April high in gold. Gold hit 24.50, okay, US dollars. Silver at that point hit, though, just short of 30. This is, again, this is mid April. Gold went sideways from mid April through recently, basically with highs in the upper 2400s, could never get to 2500. But silver, after the April high, went up into May and got to 3270. It was 10% beyond its April high. So it ran ahead of gold. And then in July, silver went down and ran behind gold. So it's just a reality of silver. However, for the remainder of what's to come, and we're focused right right now on the next couple months primarily. Yeah. Not that that's going to end it, but that yeah. that should be a dramatic phase. Silver will outpace gold. That's our argument. Uh, and uh, the gold miners, which have been dogs for the last several years compared to gold, you know, they go, gold went sideways from 2020 through 2023. The miners went down. Okay. 
but they're coming to life big time. Look at Newmont Mine, for example, the biggest gold miner in the world. In fifth, uh, they're like 37% more gold they put out than in the next big miner, Barrick Gold. Okay. Uh, they're the blue chip. Suddenly, some asset managers are starting to buy Newmont Mining. Uh, in fact, a major asset manager in the U.S., Druckenmiller, back in mid-February, said he's going to get out of some tech stocks and go into Newmont. Okay. Well, Newmont then was $32. Right now, yesterday, it traded up to 52 Okay, six months, it's gone up 60%. Not bad. Uh, so there's an asset flow, I think, into that category. And I think the miners will, for a period of time here, the next several months to a year, let's say, outperform gold again. Again, they're like a wild dog on a leash. We've plotted it many times. What we do is we divide an ounce of silver into an ounce of gold. A lot of people do the ratio. We we divide silver into gold. And right now, it's one point one something percent of the price of gold. Okay. You go back over the last 50 years and find the peak spread reading between silver and gold, dividing silver into gold, and plot that as a as a column chart, 50 years of data, you'll find that probably a third of the years involved in that 50 year process, silver reached up to about two percent of the price of gold. Some of these years weren't even bull years. Okay. Uh it's not uncommon for it to get to two and a half to 3% of the price of gold. So these aren't like aberrational highs. In fact, back in the 1980 period, silver was six and a half percent price of gold. Forget that. But even just normal hiccups and spread, it yeah. gets up to two, two and a half percent right now. We're, well, so that means if silver were 2% and gold went up to, you know, had an eightfold move, okay, Eightfold, well, why do I say that? Because the bull markets in the past 50 years have each reached at least eightfold dimension. And so a goal with 8,000 with silver 2%, well, you do the math, okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's off the page. It's off the page. Silver also has some other unique things. And by the way, that spread is beginning to turn. The silver versus gold spread. It is beginning to turn. It already broke out of a decent technical structure back in March, coincident with silver's first surge. There's another level we're watching up about 1.3% plus. If you can get a monthly close of silver where it's more than 1.3 something, we put it in our reports, there's another breakout level on the spread. And when we see that, we think we could gush up to that 2%, the 2.5% zone on silver. Again, which is not some extraordinary level. Uh, so we think that's going to happen. And we think yeah. the dynamics are there. And... Uh, Silver also has, you know, its own unique dynamics. You know, we, we've seen in the past five, 10 years, things like lithium and iron ore go ballistic on the upside for brief periods of time because there's something unique in the supply demand situation. It came and went. But in the case of silver and gold, gold is more of a constant. It's a smooth mover. It doesn't have supply uh, surprises or demand surprises. Silver, on the other hand, has that aspect. So that you could get a situation where the fa fairly tight supply situation could become a mini crisis of sorts, where suddenly there's a perception, my gosh, there's not enough silver to, to cover uh, China's demand for uh, photovoltaic cells. You know, they're 80, 90 percent of the solar market. That market's exploding annually in terms of demand, and they need silver for it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's increasing geometrically year by year, their demand for silver. Yeah. Uh, and so it's those type of variables, or in Mexico, for example, the government's talking about closing uh, all open pit mines. Well, you know, it's a minority of silver mines, but there's some quite a few silver mines that are open pit. And they're the largest silver producing country in the world. So, you know, if they execute that, it could impact some mines. Uh, these variables can cause silver to go berserk, is what I'm saying. Sure. Beyond its relationship with gold. Silver has its own unique market dynamics that could drive its price higher. Oliver points to the tight supply situation in silver, which could lead to a mini crisis if demand continues to outstrip supply. He highlights the growing demand for silver in industrial applications, particularly in photovoltaic cells used in solar panels, which is increasing geometrically year by year. Additionally, potential regulatory changes in major silver producing countries, such as Mexico, could further constrain supply. The Mexican government's discussions about closing open pit mines, which are a significant source of silver production, could have a profound impact on the market, pushing silver prices even higher. Oliver also touches on the broader market implications of the current trends in silver and gold. 
He notes that traditional safe haven assets, such as treasury bonds, have been moving in sync with gold over the past year, providing an alternative to the volatile stock market. However, unlike in previous market cycles, where bonds and gold moved together, the recent performance of bonds has been less consistent, with gold showing greater strength. He emphasizes the importance of watching for shifts in asset allocation by major portfolio managers, who may begin moving out of stocks and into safer assets like gold and bonds as market uncertainty increases. This could further fuel the momentum in gold and silver, creating a virtuous cycle of rising prices. If you just look at price itself, then we look at momentum, meaning we look at price's reflection as measured by momentum, meaning measuring price against certain long-term moving averages. And I don't mean overlaying an average where you cross it. Sometimes crossing an average is meaningless information. But we oscillate it and we create a chart that sometimes, quite often, will look different from the price chart of silver. And right now, it's far more dynamic looking than the price of silver is. The momentum stronger looking than, than the, when you look at a price chart. But let's just look at price, for example. You made a peak at $32, rounded off to $1 increments here. Let's say you're a point and figure guy, you know, X's, O's, okay? You put up ticks to 32, okay? Then you drop to 29, okay? Three down ticks. And then, oh, lo and behold, you went back up to 32 again. Bump, 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 three up ticks back to a double top at 32. Okay, then you came down and flushed that low at 29 by putting a 28 and a 27, circled down ticks. So you've cleaned out a prior low, used it for whatever it was worth in terms of downside. And now suddenly you put three upticks back on the board. You traded 30 yesterday. Yeah. You ever touch 32 again, you're sitting at a triple top and I'll guarantee it will not stop there. Okay. You'll have a price chart, point and figure, triple top breakout, touch 33. And I suspect the price guys, a lot of whom have been doubters, uh, will suddenly say, that's it. You know, I'm either in or I'm not being short anymore. Okay. So the, uh, the awareness will smack them in the face if you go back to that high. Uh, there's similar things going on in the miners. Uh, you've got a momentum breakout pending on GDX, for example, quarterly momentum that spans a ceiling on momentum that you can't see on a price chart. But if you get over one, uh, over 40, specifically 40.24, and we get up just short of 40 yesterday on GDX. You go a little bit higher than yesterday's high, and I'm going to blow out a massive ceiling on quarterly momentum that says I'm launching. It won't crawl higher anymore. It's going to zip. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have those type of technicals that are building. And in the case of Solver's price, I think what will happen is you, you smack them in the face with the 32 print again, and they're going to start to wake up. There's some intelligent folks who have their own reasons that are discussing mid-20,000 gold and so forth. And all I can say is historically over 50 years, if you go back to the mid-1970s and look where gold was in 1980, like, you know, seven, eight years later, it went from the mid-$30 range to 850, okay? Uh, yeah. Look at the 2000 basing period, 2000, 2001, you're we $250, dollars uh, By 2011, you woke, 1920. Okay, you do the multiples. Okay, yeah. right now we're starting from a low at a thousand fifty. We're only doubling. We're up one hundred and forty percent. So so far, dimensionally, relative speaking, it's a much more timid bull market than those were. But remember, most of those bull gains came in the last year of those bull markets, yeah. where gold yeah. went vertical, and silver went even more vertical. I think we're in that period now. Where we're about to enter that. Our focus is more, though, on the next two to three months. Not that it's going to end then, but I think um, much drama can occur between now and October in terms yeah. of percentage gain. T-bonds are that alternative asset you hold in the 60-40 ratio stock portfolio, right? 60% stocks, 40% bonds. If you held that in 2022, you were killed on both sides. In fact, bonds went down more on a percent basis in price than did the stock market. So it was a terrible place to be. It was not an alternative. Now, if you look at the 2007 top in the S&P through 2009, bonds went up. Price, yields went down. Gold went up. Okay. Look at the 2000 top in stocks to the 2002 low. Gold and bonds went up in price. Stocks went down. T-bonds had been moving fairly in sync with gold over the last year or so until recently. When gold made its low in February and shot up into the April period. T-bonds were still laboring. 
they had a massive momentum base they could break out of. And they broke out of it at the end of last month, getting above 120 on the T-bond futures. T-bond futures are now 125. So they've had a, a good squirt in the last three or so weeks. They have now joined gold as a viable asset alternative, meaning normal portfolio managers who were getting nervous about the stock market, who are, are skeptical, you know, and there's a lot of them that are, but they still have to be long the market because they're competing with people who are, and if they, if they don't make money in the stock market, they lose customers. But give them the least excuse and they'll start to shift assets. And I think they've already done so, like Newmont Mining. But they've also begun to move into T-bonds, back to the normal alternative. And so T-bonds and gold are both expressing directional movement that is alternative to stock market likely trend movement. Mm -hmm.